This is fun because I'm, I'm like I was just saying, I'm right up the road. I live in uh, Salem, so not too far from uh, you all. And if you're from Oregon, welcome. Um, so I, I just want to start with a um, couple of things. First of all, I would love to be able to connect afterwards. So here's where you can follow me. Um, if you're on Twitter, I'm on Twitter at Spencer Ideas. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I do a lot of different uh, sketch videos, things like that on, um, if, if you go to spencervideos.com, um, my blog and website is spencerauthor.com. And if you have questions, feel free to email me, john at spencerauthor.com. Um, here's where you can't follow me. So heads up, uh, make sure that you've always got boundaries going. Um, a quick disclaimer, uh, even though I study project-based learning and um, you know, I, I taught in a PBL framework for about 12 years as a middle school teacher, and I still use project-based learning uh, in some of the courses, um, I'm still on this journey. And I think we're all still on this journey together. And so even though I'll, I'll be sharing strategies um, in terms of, of things that have worked well, I also just wanna point out that um, I've made some big mistakes along the way as well. And uh, so, you know, it never goes entirely perfectly. And that's the beauty and the fun of project-based learning. Um, and I also just want to recognize that we're all under construction. This year has been so different compared to uh, other years. This has been um, such a unique time that we're experiencing. And um, again, I, I think it's important that we all show ourselves some grace when it, when it comes to things like project-based learning and to recognize that it's an experiment. I'm gonna share, as we think about project-based learning, I'm gonna share first what PBL was like for me as a student. And to do that, I wanna share one sentence that changed my world forever. So a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in the ice age. Uh, it's where I learned how to stop and collaborate and listen. It was at a time when this bad boy was considered cutting edge and my biggest concern with technology was to avoid getting dysentery on the Oregon Trail. This was me in the eighth grade. I was incredibly shy and incredibly nerdy. Uh, I had one friend, well, we'll call him Matt since that's his name. And we were two nerds in a pod. We would hang out every single day at lunchtime. And we would talk about data, right? We would talk about Star Trek data. We would talk about um, data in terms of baseball data. If, it, it, you know, we would argue about things and we would just spend our lunch period nerding out. And my whole goal in middle school was to be invisible. Again, if we think about the 1980s, 1990s, the nerds were the tropes to be tolerated, not the characters to be loved. You know, Screech was the annoying character that you laughed at. Zach Morris is who you wanted to be. And so I knew that if I could go through middle school and be invisible, then that would be successful for me. That would be how I defined success. So sixth grade rolls around and Matt and I hang out every day at lunchtime and we're good. And Matt is there every single day. He gets the congratulations on your immune system certificate at the end of each year. And I can always depend on him to be there. And then seventh grade rolls around, same kind of thing. Eighth grade happens. But then there's a moment in the second week of school where it never occurs to me that Matt might get sick for a day. And it's not a big deal. But I remember going to the cafeteria and I look out at the sea of students all around and I just wait for someone to invite me to the table because Matt is gone and our spot is empty and I'm not gonna sit there completely alone and eat my lunch. And so I wait and I wait and I wait and I just keep hoping that someone will invite me to the table, but it doesn't happen. So I throw my food in the garbage can. I hide out in the boys restroom and I wait for those 22 painfully long minutes to go by. And then the bell rings 
and I wipe the tears off of my eyes and I head into class. And I re realized something in this moment. I wanted to be invisible and I was invisible, but not to Mrs. Smoot or to Mr. Darrow. They knew me. They knew that I loved baseball. They knew that I had a heart for social justice and for issues going on in our world. And they knew that I nerded out on history. They knew that much about me already. And so that day, Mrs. Smoot came up to me and she invited me to be a part of the History Day project. Now, the way that the History Day competition worked is you had to present this in a big competition in front of a bunch of people. Um, there were a couple of different options. One of them was the media one. And she said, I think you would love to do a slide presentation. You should do it. And I said, I am not going to present in front of a big packed room full of people. There's no way that I'll do this. And I remember she said, um, here's the deal. Every single Friday, you can work on this project. And then you don't have to do our social studies class. You'll just be excused to work on this project. And I thought, okay, this is intriguing. And she said, and you are completely excused from homework for the year. This will be your homework. And I was thinking, okay, this is sounding even better. And then she said, John, I'm going to warn you, if you do this project, you will work harder on this project than you've ever worked in your life. And I just kind of silently laughed it off and thought, you know what, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this because I like this idea of no homework. And so I went ahead and I joined this project. And it was less than a week into it that I immediately began to regret this decision. See, I was really good at playing the game of school. I knew how to uh, keep the teachers happy so that I would keep my parents happy. I knew how to get A's in classes that I liked, B's in classes that I didn't like. I knew how to put in the bare minimum amount of work for the highest amount of grade. I played the game of school like no other kid. And suddenly I couldn't play this game anymore. It was disorienting, it was frustrating, but it was also exciting. I came up with a list of topics and I went up to Mrs. Smoot and I said, which topic should I choose? And she said, choose whatever topic will sustain your interest for the entire time. So I chose the integration of baseball, the story of Jackie Robinson, <coughs> the story of the Negro Leagues and what had led up to that. And then I, I went up to Mr. Darrow and I said, how do you want us to organize our research? Do you want note cards? Do you want this? Do you want that? I've always had a teacher tell me the way to do it. And he said, which way works best for you? And I said, just tell me how you want it. And he said, this is about what you need. And so I chose my way of organizing my research. And I began to look at you know, answers in books. And I grew frustrated when I couldn't find all of the answers in different books. And I realized I was going to have to actually talk to people. And so I reached out to a museum it was a brand new Negro League Museum, this guy named Buck O'Neill. And he uh, introduced me to all of these former baseball players. And I began to interview these players. And it was totally real and authentic. And I dove into that project. It was terrifying to talk to strangers. I remember half the time I would dial the phone and then I would hang up because I was so scared to talk. And then I would dial again and they would be angry because someone had just called them and hung up. And I would whisper and barely get any words out and I would stumble on my words. But then by the end, I was so glad that I captured their stories and I participated in making history and, and being a historian. And I began to craft my script and, and go through all these different interviews and books and articles. And I fell in love with the topic I, and I fell in love with history. And I began working harder on that project than I'd ever worked on anything in my life. Mrs. Smoot was absolutely right. It was almost time to present. And then we went to a radio studio. Now this was back in the day, if you can imagine this, and the only way you could record audio and edit the audio was using these big reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And then you would splice it together with a, a razor blade and, and scotch tape. And that's how you would make 
you know, an, an edited audio uh, background for your slide presentation. And so I was so excited, you know, we were get, gonna get to go to a radio studio. They were donating radio time, studio time. We were so lucky. I knew how fortunate I was. And I went to the radio studio, I recorded my script. I had messed up, you know, two or three different times, but I, but I was ready to go and they, they played it back and I listened to it. And I said, Mrs. Smoot, I, I can't do this. All I could hear was how bad my voice sounded, how, how crackly it sounded, how, you know, how I could hear my braces, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I said, I, I'm not going to present in front of the class. And Mrs. Smoot said, when you hide your voice, you rob the world of your creativity. And I'm not going to let you do that. And so I went ahead and I did a couple more takes and I recorded it and I edited it. And then it was ready to go. So about two weeks later, it's time to present. And the night before I got no sleep and sleep is my absolute favorite. All I could think about was what if people don't like it? What if they laugh? What if it doesn't go right? What if I make a mistake? First period comes around, it's a cycle. What if, what if, what if? Second period, same thing. Third period, what if, what if? And lunchtime, I hang out with Matt and I start thinking maybe, maybe I shouldn't present. Maybe I'm not ready for this. What if, what if, what if? I show up to class right after lunch. The room is dark and the students start streaming in. I take my cassette, I put it in that boom box. My slide projector is ready. It's that big circular slide projector and I'm ready to go. I press play on the button, but my hand is so shaky and I'm so nervous that I click backwards instead of forward. And then I try to go forward, but it goes backwards again. And then it goes forward and backward. And now awkward silence. A couple kids start laughing, whispering. I don't know what to do. But I keep pressing the buttons and trying to problem solve it in the moment. And although it feels like it's an, an eternity, it's only about 10 seconds that goes by before I find the slide. My heart is hammering, my pulse is pounding, but I've got it. Click. I've got it. Click. Click. I go through the entire slide presentation. And when it's done, all I can think about is, you know, oh, I, I messed up. I should have done this. I should have done that. But to my surprise, the students actually cheer. In fact, every kid stands up and they give me a standing ovation because they know how hard I've worked. And in this moment, I am not invisible anymore. So I went up to Mrs. Smoot and I said, it is too late to join the competition, but if there's anybody who drops out of our competition, let me know because I would love to join. And she just smiled and she said, John, we've already signed you up. We expect you to be there. Do you wanna be part of it? And I said, absolutely. And so she had me practice with probably 10 more classrooms and give this presentation. And it went better and better each time until it was finally time for me to actually present in the competition. And I went from the the district competition and I won that. I went to the state competition and actually won the state of California state competition. And then I went to the national competition and I got to go to Washington DC and it was a powerful learning experience for me. Now, she was my hero, she still is. She is why I uh, majored in history. She is why I fell in love with that subject. She is why I became a teacher. I became a different person because of that project-based experience. And the key thing that you'll notice is this was not a culminating project. This was learning through the project rather than learning and then doing a project at the end, right? The whole thing was project-based and I was empowered with voice and choice. So I would love, if you're willing in the chat, what do you think would be some benefits of having students engage in project-based learning. And as you're doing that, I'll just share um, that for years, we were taught this formula in school. Work hard at school, graduate from college, 
and climb the corporate ladder. Now, I want to point out that this formula that we were taught was never available to everybody, right? If you were a person of color, you faced uh, systemic injustice and barriers that made you know, graduating from university and climbing the corporate ladder even more challenging, right? If you were a woman, there were this, uh, similar challenges in, in terms of university and corporate ladder. Um, this formula was why my dad grew up poor, truly poor, and ended up upper middle class, right? However, my mom in the 19, early 1960s, when she wanted to go to university and uh, major in engineering, she was outright told this is not what women major in. And she was not allowed to join the engineering program at her university. So I wanna recognize this formula was never available to everyone. However, it was what we were all taught, right? And I would argue that now because of automation, artificial intelligence, globalization, the latter has now become a maze. And it's not, it's not as easy to just climb the corporate ladder. We know based on our statistics that our students are gonna change jobs every five to seven years. And I've seen this with you know, people in, in anywhere from you know, actuarial science on one side to being a, a, a alignment on the other side, working on power lines. Like, there's changing of jobs and companies constantly. And because of this, students are gonna need to navigate that maze. So my question is this, I would love for you to share it in the chat. Um, what skills will students need in order to navigate the maze? And I wanna point out, by the way, the ladder becoming a maze. I mentioned that my dad climbed the corporate ladder. He worked the same job for 35 years. But when he left the company he worked for, half the jobs that had existed when he began no longer existed. They were not hiring people anymore to do shorthand. That used to be a job, hire people to write in shorthand. On the other hand, there was this whole side of artificial intelligence that did not exist when he began that's now a major segment of where he worked. So flexibility, openness to learn, communication, teamwork, self-motivation, absolutely. And I gotta say, the maze to me is a little bit scary. As a dad with you know two, one kid who is a, a sophomore in high school, one kid who is about to become a freshman, another one who's about to become se a, a seventh grader, it is scary for me to think about the maze. I like the predictability of the ladder, right? However, if the scary side is that the rules have changed, the exciting side is that our students get to rewrite those rules. And I love the fact that um, my kids are gonna get to rewrite those rules. That's kind of the exciting part of this. And when it comes to a ladder, there's often only one person can be on each rung, but when it comes to a maze, they get to work collaboratively. I love that someone said openness to learning, communication, teamwork, absolutely. So if we think about this, you know, Students will be empowered, need to be empowered in their learning. They're gonna to need to be empathetic as they navigate that maze. They're gonna to need to learn skills like project management and creativity. They're gonna to need to um, have new perspectives, engaging inquiry, communication, research, critical thinking. They're gonna to have to be adaptable. They're gonna to need to develop that growth mindset, which would lead to perseverance. For, you know, one of the major things I think about is that to navigate that maze, they will have to be self-directed in their lear learning. By that, I mean, they will need to be self-starters, take the initiative, get started. They're also going to need to be self-managers, which means having that ability to self-regulate, to manage how things are going, to constantly assess, monitor progress. And that requires this shift in student agency toward empowerment. If we think about student agency this way, on one hand, we have compliance. I'm doing something because I have to. We have engagement. I'm doing something because I want to. And then we have empowerment where it's really, I'm doing something out of a sense of ownership and buy-in. And one of the ways to get there 
is through this PBL process. What happens when teachers design projects that empower students with voice and choice? Students embrace a maker mindset. They define themselves as inventors and creators. They learn to take creative risks. Here they experiment and engage in iterative thinking. When this happens, they embrace a growth mindset and grow resilient. They become problem solvers and systems thinkers. They become divergent thinkers, thinking outside the box. They'll use creative constraint to find original uses for materials. Here they discover it's okay to be different. Often students embrace curiosity and wonder. They become explorers, seeking out new information and thinking critically. They grow more empathetic as they design meaningful products that they launch to the world. On an academic level, students are more engaged and the information sticks. There's often an increase in student achievement. Meanwhile, they learn key skills like project management, collaboration, and communication. True, these projects will prepare students for the creative economy, but more importantly, they empower students for a creative life. Here they see that making is magic. We know that there's a time crunch in schools. Materials can be scarce. Sometimes you're stuck with a tight curriculum map. But when you, as a teacher, empower your students with voice and choice, they become the makers who change the world. All right, so what I want to get into now is if that's the case, there are many different ways for us to empower students. It could be inquiry-based learning, it could be design thinking, it could be project-based learning. Um, and there are gonna be some great ideas shared throughout this week. So I, I wanna point out PBL is not the only way to get here. It could be some great Socratic seminars that you're doing, or it could be the workshop model. But I wanna share um, a little bit about the PBL process. And so there's a lot of different ways to think about project-based learning. There are a lot of different models. Um, but in general, here are some trends that you see. You often start with some kind of starting place. Um, I love the term provocation, you know, something that's going to provoke thought, something that's going to hook into prior knowledge. And there are many different starting places for your provocation. So your starting place in a, pro uh, 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 in a project. In some cases, you're, you're going to start your project with a product in mind. Um, what I mean by this is, students will know, I'm gonna make a blank. We're going to film a documentary. We're going to record a podcast. We're going to write a novel, whatever it may be. Sometimes they know the product in advance and you inspire them by sharing a concept of what kind of product you're going to create. Um, in my case with that History Day project, I knew I was going to make a slideshow. Um, but it was gonna be a highly developed slideshow with multimedia elements, things like that. Um, sometimes it's awareness of an issue. There's some kind of issue going on um, and you're gonna come up with a solution based on a general awareness of the, the issues going on. So for example, I'll, I'll give a, a science related one. Um, a couple of summers ago, we lost our drinking water where I live. So I live in Salem, Oregon, and in the west side of, of town, um, we got, got our water from Detroit Lake and we had toxic algae that prevented us from being able to drink the drinking water. Um, and so as a teacher, you could start with that. Here's the issue, here's what went on, and then students will engage in an inquiry, they're gonna ask questions, and eventually what they'll do is come up with some solution to the water crisis that we had, right? There could be some solution related to you know, climate science on one hand, or it could be a technological solution they develop. But you know, the starting place could be awareness of an issue. Um, sometimes it's a natural phenomenon. Um, you know, there's this whole aspect of STEM called biomimicry, where you know you introduce students to a natural phenomenon, and from there they're going to design projects that. Um, incorporate that natural phenomenon. 
uh, I was working with some uh, fifth grade students in robotics and we actually studied bird beaks. So we had them look at all kinds of different bird beaks to try to um, figure out what kinds of different appendages you would use for robotics and what you would design robotics wise um, in a robotics competition. So even though the robotics competition we tend to think of as being challenge oriented, we began with bird beaks as a way to study the way these different bird beaks worked as we were thinking about different types of things that could um, you know, find things, reach things, claw at things, get things, and that led to deeper design and, and better design in their robotics projects that they were doing. Sometimes it's a geeky interest. So um, when I taught middle school, we did the, these things called geek out blogs. And at the beginning of the year, students would geek out on whatever topic they wanted. And um, you know, so we had one student doing a biology blog, another student choosing to do this um, video game blog. And it was very choice-based. They were choosing a topic and it was based on their geeky interests, whatever they kind of nerded out about, they got to do. And what I love about it is we have one student, Isabel, who um, is now a biology major um, and, and her passion just continued to grow as a result as she got to blog and, and found an audience for her blogging about biology. Um, and then on the other hand, we had Marco, who was a struggling reader, a struggling writer. And this is where, you know, today's topic of PBL for all makes sense. You know, we have one student who is gifted, but another student who is a struggling reader, struggling writer. There's some um, areas that, that he really dealt with that were, were a huge challenge. And what I love is that he found an audience, too. Um, when he pressed publish on accident instead of save as a draft, my heart sank. I was so sure that kids were going to be picking on him. And to my surprise, there were 10 comments. And those 10 comments were all affirmation. They were all kind comments. And he slowly developed an audience. And so even though reading and writing was a challenge for him, he was getting voice and choice and finding an audience as well. Sometimes it's a problem that needs to be solved. When I was a kid, someone realized that haircuts were messy. And so they decided to combine a hair trimmer and a vacuum cleaner, and they invented a Flobie. And I begged my mom for a Flobie. And she said, John, you're not going to get a Flobie. You are, that is not a normal thing to ask for for Christmas. And I begged her and begged her for a Flobie. And she said, no, you'll use it on the dog. And she was right. So I never got a Flobie. But I mentioned this because sometimes what kids create doesn't work. Sometimes they create Flobies. Sometimes they create really weird stuff. And that's okay too, because when they design things and they're solving problems, they're becoming divergent thinkers. It's not what they create that matters, it's who they become that matters. It's how they change as a result. And then sometimes there's empathy. And I love when we can incorporate empathy to our provocation, our beginning place, because when this happens, you end up with a deeper level human driven projects. I remember we had um, a huge problem in our school with graffiti. It was all over campus and we had painted uh, two or three times, maybe more. We had painted over the graffiti and it, and, and it just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And then I said, we're gonna use this design thinking process. It's gonna be a project-based learning experience. And we're gonna do like a Shark Tank style project where you have to come up with a solution and then share it with this panel of people who will determine if, if it's an idea that they want to actually spend some money on. We had gotten a little bit of money from school, a little bit of money from a small business owner, a little bit of money um, to use for whatever solution was. And I remember one group chose empathy with the people who actually did graffiti. 
And so they partnered with the police department and um, the police introduced them to some people who had to pay restitution. They were not glorifying vandalism or anything like that, but they wanted to find out why do people do this? And then they also met with a small um, a, a community organization um, and they, they who had contacts with people who had gotten caught doing graffiti. We were a low income Title I school. This is right in our community. And what they discovered in that process is they actually created a map and they found that there were hot spots with graffiti. And then there were places that were completely left alone. So there was a, a beautiful community center and library, and that had never been tagged at all. There was a, a church across from the school, beautiful church that had never been tagged at all. And they said, there are some spaces that are sacred spaces, libraries, churches, community centers. And there are some places that are just begging to be tagged up, like the back of the Walmart. It's a giant white box. It's begging to be tagged up. And they said, what if school looked less like a Walmart and more like a sacred space? So they pitched their idea and there's the business owner and the community activist and the principal. And they said, we wanna paint murals. And to our surprise, to their surprise, this was the winning one. And we ended up painting eight murals over three years. Now, when you do that, whatever your provocation is, you will often then develop a driving question. In many project-based learning opportunities, teachers will create the driving question for the students. One of the things I found was it, it, it can actually work really well to have students come up with a driving question. What is the big question that we're asking that will drive the entire PBL experience? From there, you move to the second phase of inquiry. This is when students are gonna be asking questions. This provocation is gonna naturally spur their curiosity and they're gonna be chasing their curiosity. Now, why would some students struggle to be curious? I would love for people um, to share in the chat. What do you think are some of the reasons some students struggle with being curious? They want the right answer, yeah. I, I observed this teacher, uh, Michelle Baldwin, and she was teaching early elementary students and their, her students were asking such great, amazing, in-depth questions. And I asked her, what are you doing that's allowing them to ask great questions? And she said, sometimes the bravest thing you can do is ask a question. And I love that concept of, of, of getting them to be over the fear of getting the, the wrong answer, the fear of asking the wrong question. Um, but I also think one of the things I discovered is that if we're going to do PBL for all, this means supporting students who struggle with things like asking great questions. I, uh, a lot of my students were English language learners and they needed some help with the language side of asking questions. So uh, I found that it really helps to do things like having critical thinking questions, sentence stems that they can use for analytical questions, application questions, evaluate, uh, you know, evaluative questions and providing these supports for them as they develop their questions. Again, that it fits into this idea of project-based learning for all because now they can access the language, but it's still their curiosity. It's still their question that they're asking. Uh, someone put, are your sentence stems on your site? I don't know if I have them on my site, but um, I, I will provide this uh, slideshow for anyone to, to look at afterwards. So I'll send it to Chris and he'll, uh, I'm sure be able to, to hook you up with a slideshow uh, as well. That inquiry then leads to the next phase where students engage in research. And the research can be all kinds of research. It could be articles they read. It could be data that they look at. It could be videos that they watch or audio podcasts. It could be experiments that they do. It could be interviewing experts. One of the things I found um, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm a professor right now. One of the things I found this year in working with student teachers 
is that they have had an easier time in their classes getting students to interview experts using video conferencing because so many experts have become really comfortable with Zoom and Google Meets and things like that. And so um, although the quarantine has been really hard and I don't wanna make light of that at all, um, one thing I will say that comes out of it is people have gotten way more comfortable with you know, synchronous video meetings. And so when we've done design thinking projects and PBL projects, um, what we found is a lot of students are having a much easier time getting a hold of experts and doing these video uh, conferences with them, which, which just adds this layer of authenticity to the research process. Um, it also helps though, if we're gonna have PBL for all in this phase, especially if you're doing group projects to build an interdependency. And so interdependent learning is where, you know, if it's this overlap between independent and dependent. So independent work would be, I'm doing this all on my own. I have to do this, you know, dependent learning is I'm depending on the teacher for everything. I'm depending on group mates for everything. Interdependent learning is this overlap between them. It's this idea of saying, I'm going to learn from you and you're going to learn from me. I'm going to have voice and choice myself, but I'm also going to learn how to listen and empathize with my teammates. So I'll give us a short example of what this looks like in research. Um, like I mentioned before, in the last phase of inquiry, students are generating their own list of, of questions. Well, they're gonna take those questions and use them for research, which requires students to generate questions on their own. Then they combine their questions. And then what you can do is give each member a role as they analyze the questions and come up with their end results. So they're gonna the, analyze with each member kind of looking at these questions and then end up with their final questions that they use as they engage in research. Um, there's also structures that you can do to help students with research. So again, you can introduce them with, hey, here are five ways to do research. Here's note card research. Here's um, you know a table with the question, the answer, the source, and a paraphrase of, of the facts that you found, things like that. And then you can model those four or five different ways of doing research and let individual students choose which way they want to, to uh, have students engage in the research process. Um, I love this question from uh, Deb Bailey. Uh, what has been your experience with this type of learning in families? Parents may perceive this type of learning as not real school because that is not how they learned. Is one thing to teach teachers? Yeah, so this is something I'm gonna say briefly about parents and family members. I think it's really important that we emphasize when we're doing project-based learning that we are still gonna teach all of the same content and all of the same standards. We are still gonna have some times where we have students um, in small groups. We're still gonna do some direct instruction, but we're gonna be learning through the project rather than just doing a project at the end. The other thing that I found is the way it's communicated can be, we're gonna do learning at a higher level. A project is gonna be more rigorous, it's gonna be more challenging, it's gonna be at a higher level than we normally would. And a lot of the parents that would be worried about, you know, is this, are they gonna be learning everything they're supposed to learn? We're, we're able to say, actually, we're gonna learn it at a higher level. And then the other piece that I found to be really helpful is that little graph, a graphic of the ladders become a maze is a really great starting place for you know parents, guardians, family members um, as we think about what do they need to nav navigate that maze. And as we talk about those soft skills, then I can say, hey, we're not going to do project-based learning all the time, but we're going to do project-based learning for this particular unit, and that's going to help them develop the soft skills while also learning the content. And if they realize that each member is going to be personally responsible, which you notice in this, this process of interdependency, um, if they know that every group member is going to be personally responsible, that the 
the lessons are gonna still be rigorous, that the standards are still gonna be met, that you're still gonna teach the content. Then what I find is they become really open to project-based learning. Even though it's different, they see that it ha kind of needs to be different. I will also say this, the school environment makes a difference. Um, I have found, you know, in, again, in working with student teachers who are in all kinds of environments and, and they're implementing project-based learning, you know, a lot of them will tell me that um, it, it's about the families in the areas that, that, that they're at, right? So, um, you know, rural, urban might make a difference. The region that you're in might make a difference. The school history that may, might make a difference. And so inviting parents to be a part of that conversation becomes really important. I'm going to move on to the next part. Um, Oh, I love that, Deb. Yes, it, uh, an excellent way to uh, teach media literacy. Absolutely. And if you have access to a school librarian, I'm a huge fan of partnering with librarians um, and actually doing some mini lessons on media literacy and information literacy. I think that can be really powerful. Um, as they go through the inquiry process, they do research what they're doing is they're building up that background knowledge. So they have all of this background knowledge. And then from the background knowledge, they can begin to engage in an ideation process where they're actually generating their own ideas. Um, Chris Lehman makes the distinction, and I love it, between recipe-based learning and project-based learning. And he says, you know, if you get 30 of the same project back to you, that's not a project that's a recipe. Students should be generating original ideas here. So we use the acronym PARTS uh, in the book launch. It's product idea, audience, role, um, tasks, and solutions. And the goal is to have them clarify each, you know, each one of those. What are the what is the product concept? Who is my audience? Again, make sure they've really developed empathy with an audience. Who are the roles? Um, you know, who's going to do what? The tasks and the solution. And then what I find to be really helpful in terms of project-based learning for all is to empower students to own the project management process, have them set goals, break down tasks, choose strategies. Um, there's a lot of different great tools. I love using um, Trello. Um, it's just a pretty authentic tool. It's what people use in the workforce a lot of times. Um, it lets students move, you know, these task cards around. And um, I find it really helpful to have one member of the group, um, a, a responsible student becomes kind of the project manager. And then my job as a teacher is I'm no longer managing, you know, every student's project. They're managing their own project and I'm just checking up with them to see how they're doing. Another option is the project management log, um, or there's a, a similar idea of a project management spreadsheet that works really well. You know, who's responsible for, for it? What's the task? What's the due date status? Sometimes you add another um, column for materials that are needed and, um, you know, progress, and that becomes another way to do it. You can also have students visualize their project. Um, I'm not going to get into this just for the sake of time, but it allows students to kind of create a, a big calendar with sticky notes and they move it along as they share you know, each strategy that they're doing and, 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 and come up with their tasks for their project. So that, that becomes another way to have them own the project management process. Um, when that begins to happen, students move to a place where they're prototyping, you know, they're creating something for their project. And sometimes they're going to make physical products. So we did like solar kitchen projects, for example. Sometimes it's digital, like a blog, podcast, videos. Sometimes uh, it's a service project that they're going to do. They're going to get out in the community and do some kind of service project. Um, now, what if you don't have the best materials? I really think that sometimes some of the best materials um, are lo-fi. They're things like duct tape and cardboard. You, know, you might not have the best CAD machines or 3D printers or things like that. And, and yet sometimes the small hands-on stuff works really, really well. And every roadblock is a chance to solve a problem. It's where your creativity makes a difference as a, a teacher. And as this happens, students will naturally move into a phase where they're going to revise their work. And the goal with revision is they're developing 
iterative thinking. They're developing that growth mindset. And you're, they're, they're learning that failure is permanent, but failing is temporary. So they're learning how to fail forward and improve. And it's that the notion that every mistake is another iteration closer to, su- uh, to success. I've had them prototype in Tinkercad too. Yes, I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Ken. That can be an excellent way to prototype. Um, and the goal is to, to have them celebrate their risk-taking as they revise their work. One of the things I found is that the revision phase can actually be a challenge for certain high achievers who have gotten used to um, always getting the right answer, right? Uh, schools tend to value getting the right answer and getting it quickly. And revision says, slow down and iterate, improve. No one gets it right the first time. And that can be kind of a mental block for a lot of students. Um, And that's why I think it really helps to empower students to own this assessment process. So self-assessment, you know, tracking goals, doing surveys, reflections, rubrics, checklists, all of those. Yeah, time to multiple choice tests. Oh, I'm so with you, Dad. That's that's the that, that's the bane of uh, my existence as a teacher. Um, fortunately, right now at the university level, I don't have that. But um, I will point this out: when I taught project-based learning, it always felt scary to teach this way and to know I was going to be assessed through those, you know, timed multiple choice tests. However, I will say students tended to do really, really well on, um, on the, those benchmark and state tests. Um, so there's all of these ways. There's uh, conferences, self-reflections, concept maps. Um, you can also have students engage in peer assessment. Uh, here's a small example. You know, we use this 10-minute system where they do an elevator pitch, clarifying questions, feedback, paraphrase, and then next steps. Uh, We also use things like mastermind groups. Um, And so there's a lot of different ways to empower them to own this assessment process. And then that frees you up as a teacher to do some of these one-on-one conferences or even small group conferences where you come in, you lead reflection, you guide them in the process, uh, and there's all kinds of different ways. At that point, though, you also want to have them reflect on their progress. So one of the hard lessons for me as a teacher was that not every project turns out right. That sometimes kids won't finish a project. Sometimes kids will have projects that fail. And so sometimes they need to reflect on their project and go, you know what, that was a failed experiment. Sometimes they'll look at a project and go, that didn't work, but I could do a mashup with two things that didn't work and it becomes something that does work. Other times they go, you know what, I could revise this and make it awesome. And sometimes they say, I'm going to refine it and improve it next time. And so there's there's this whole continuum of how they might reflect on their projects. But ultimately, if the project has been successful, if they're happy with how it's turned out, then it's a chance to launch their work to an audience. I would love for you to share in the chat, what is the value of having students share their work with an authentic audience. I love that uh, one piece of pie to group members. Love that concept, Kim. It's great. Authentic feedback, loving that idea to take it more seriously. You know, for me, it's all of these things. It's learning how to embrace constructive criticism, becoming fearless. It's, It's how hard they work when it's authentic. You know, they will always work harder for an authentic audience than they will for me. Um, Public speaking, yes, self-confidence. And I think there's things that you can do. You can help help them navigate, you know, layers of privacy. Do we want this to to be launched to the school, to the community, to the local community, to the whole, you know, global audience, wherever it may be. And they can kind of decide where that's gonna be. And I think what you're saying is when you launch your work, you're saying, I'm not afraid to be known. And I think that's really powerful. Too often in school, work ends up on the refrigerator, but this is saying, we're going to share it with someone else, right? You don't have to publish it to, the, to your backpack or, or share it with a teacher. It's going to go to someone uh, bigger and more authentic than just the classroom or the teacher. 
so much of it shine through the project. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. Um, my final piece that I will say as we kind of close this up is it doesn't always work out perfectly, right? So we did that graffiti uh, project. It was an example of, of really empathy-oriented de design thinking. And although everything had been working really well, we had a new teacher, or sorry, a, a, a new principal come in after three years. And um, I, I still remember she walked into the classroom and uh, she looked at the mural that we had been working on and she turned to the custodian and said, that's gotta go. That doesn't look professional. And then we went into uh, spring break. We came back from spring break and two of the murals that we had painted on, on, on big canvases, you know, big sheets that we're gonna hang up inside the school were in the dumpster. And one that we had painted outside had already been painted white. And I remember being really frustrated by that experience. And one of the students um, came up to me and said, I don't want to share any of my work with anybody. He wanted to make his blog private. He didn't want to do podcasts anymore. And they'd been working on a really cool STEM project. And he just said, I don't want that to go to anybody because what if people don't like it? What if it just gets trashed? What if we make this thing and it just gets thrown away and not used? And I remember saying to him, um, when you hide your voice, you rob the world of your creativity and I'm not gonna let you do that. What you have deserves to be shared and that who you are deserves to be shared. And that people can destroy your work, but they can never destroy the creative thinking that goes on in your mind. And it wasn't until I drove home that day that I realized that I had basically quoted Mrs. Smoot. And although it was hard that those murals got painted over, fast forward five years, and uh, actually, yeah, six years, and one of the uh, students who had been there for my first year was now a teacher. And she emailed me and uh, she said, guess what we're gonna be doing? And I said, nah, what, what, what's, what's going on? And she said, she showed a, a picture of the sketch that a kid had done. And she showed a couple of other pictures of the kids beginning to draw the mural on the wall. And one of the teachers that I had worked with when we did the murals was now the principal. Uh, one of the students that had been in the class was now leading it. And one of the kids who had painted, uh, done the initial sketches was now a professional artist and muralist. And he was an artist in residence helping the students in that process. And so now in that school district, there are four or five schools with murals all over. And it's beautiful and it's amazing. They've painted these gorgeous murals all over the place. And for me, it was a reminder with project-based learning that it is not about the product and it's not even about the PBL process. It's about the people because Mrs. Smoot was never any of those kids' teachers, but none of that would have happened without her. And the true legacy that goes in ripples over and over again is the way that teachers, when they empower their students with voice and choice, the ripples of impact that they have that continues to impact more and more people. And so my final thought is just thank you for the work that you're doing and for the way that you're empowering students with voice and choice. Wow, thank you so much, John. That was awesome. That was so good. I. I Thank you so much for sharing those stories. It was such a great presentation. Uh, Thank you. I think we have two questions right here in the chat. Um, yeah. that I may ask you from Kenan. Um, how familiar are you or the audience with early years of ex expeditionary learning or connected learning alliance? I'm not familiar with Connected Learning Alliance, so I would love to check that out. Um, I am familiar with expeditionary learning, and I, I really see it as like a strong overlap with PBL. So 
you know, you could definitely be be doing expeditionary learning and project based learning and kind of like find that overlap between the two. Um, and and it, it works really well. I'm going to go up the chat here because I think there was one you, you've touched on a lot of the questions a little bit, um, but there was one here. I mean, in from Deb. Um, <laughs> Deb's my partner, by the way, so I'm going to brag a little bit that uh, she, she has some really good questions. Um, yeah. Schools it. teachers rely so much on test scores to measure outcomes, but it, ten, it tends to miss the mark on the true impact on the learners. If you had to choose the metrics for PBL impact, what would you use? You know, I really think I would go two routes. I would, I would do um, student self-assessment on soft skills. Like, I really think that that's what I, that, that becomes really important um, and how well they're able to, to look at that. Um, and then, and then I would also go to like standard based um, assessment of the learning mastery. You know, did they master the standards and did they develop those soft skills? And I find that that works better than doing just a project rubric that evaluates, you know, their finished product. Like I really want to see um, who are they becoming and what are they learning more so than what did they make and how good is it? And there's some great, there's some great examples of people who have done that really well. Um, yeah. Well, we're at time. Uh, yeah. Though I, I think we could, uh, but nobody, nobody has left. So yeah, it was just, <laughs> well, I want to honor people's time. So thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, really appreciate this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll share the presentation link with mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, and I'll get with you to get the slideshow. The slideshow was probably yeah. was just amazing with all those thank great you. graphics you've created and drawings. But uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for kicking off STEM week for us. Uh, couldn't have gone better uh, than we, you know, if we had planned it any different. So just really happy that you were here. Happy the proud and excited that you're working with student teachers and getting these ideas to them. It really means, I think it's really important. So thank you so much, John. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.